All right, recording has started. Um, so I think all the participants, what we'll have you do is if you want to talk, to go ahead and raise your hand, and then one of the presenters will call on you. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to the presenters, um, and then they can go ahead and introduce themselves. Great. Thank you, Brandon. So welcome, everybody, to our presentation on our immersive learning experience design model. My name is Jim Kiggins. I'm the director of the Immersive Learning Experience team. Um, and with me today is Vashko Torres, the development lead of the Immersive Learning Experience team, and Emily Battaglia, the uh, learning experience design lead from the Immersive Learning Experience team. So our team is in the Innovation Center of Excellence at, at Talum Global Education. And our team produces game-based learning and simulations that are delivered in VR and supported by AI for use in the classroom for our eight institutions at Italum across the globe. Over the last uh, five years, we have produced 15 titles that are in use for more than 1,596 classes with 67,600 learners that have played more than 762,500 game or simulation sessions. So what we're going to do in this presentation is uh, we're going to divide it into three parts. Emily's going to give you an overview of the ILXD model that we use in practice. Vashko is going to share some highlights with a case study um, product of ours, which is our MyVRScope um, Immersive Enterprise Lab uh, system. And then I'm going to follow with some development um, highlights and notes for deploying and Supporting immersive learning in the field. So take it away, Emily. Thanks, Jim. Hi, everybody. Um, it is my pleasure today to talk to you about the ILXD model that we've developed, um, which is a best practice model for creating immersive learning experiences. The practice that drives ILXD is the genuine focus on the learner. The learner drives and informs everything from problem identification and needs assessment design, development, play test, release, and reassessment, the learner is involved in every step. Through the layers of the ILXD model, we leverage elements of design, technologies, processes, and educational theory to intentionally create a learning experience that empowers the learner to become fully immersed, to care, and to create and construct the most effective learning experience for themselves. Next slide, please. Yep, thanks. So I am gonna go through the layers really quickly, just so you know what we're talking about, what we're basing everything on. So the first layer is our intention layer. And we want the learner to be involved in this layer as well as faculty and administration. But essentially what we're doing is we're intentionally designing an experience that is measurable. And in order to do that, we analyze the need and we take a look at what the learner really wants. We utilize design thinking. We think about the user experience. We think about how we can, in how we can design inclusively, um, as well as how to leverage each type of game-based learning. And uh, do we need machine learning? Do we need analytics? So we think about all of that with the learner in mind. The, and I should mention before we move on that not every product is going to have the same need or emphasis on each of these layers. It really does depend on the learner need. Um, so next slide, please. The immersion layer is the first layer that's from the learner's point of view. So we want the learner to put the headset on or get in the game and say, I'm here now and my choices determine everything. And the way we do that is to leverage agency. We make the experience authentic. We make sure that the learner can make meaningful decisions and that they are able to give and receive meaningful content in that experience. So they're immersed. And then the next thing we want is for them to feel. So the next slide, please. The learner then says, I care about the story and my role in the experience. And in order to get the learner to this layer of learning, we leverage narrate, narrative, um, sense-making, persistence, and essentially 
we are uh, <laughs> we're trying to leverage what we know most about the learner. So what delights them? What motivates them? What makes them care? And so this is how, this is why from the very beginning, we're asking the learner what they need, what they like, who they are. So then we can get them to feel and be em empathetic within their learning experience. Next slide, please. So our final layer is the learn layer. So we have them immersed. They're feeling connected to the learning experience. And now they are the creator and they care about their experience with others. So now they're creating an, a constructivist experience that is truly based off of their needs, interests, and what's gonna keep them motivated. Next slide, please. So as part of the intention layer, that first layer at the bottom there, we work with learners to create learning experience objectives that will measure the efficacy of the immersive learning experience. Next slide, please. So learning experience objectives, or we call them LEXOs, drive the design and development of the product to ensure our focus remains on the learner. So you've all seen, most likely, the standard learning objectives. Let's go through the reason for the change from the standard learning objectives. So, First, you have the audience, which is the learner. Then you have the behavior, which is the verb that reflects the complexity of the behavior that needs to change. Then you have the condition, which is the method with which the learner's behavior will be measured. And then you have the degree of mastery, which is a specific action required to make the learner change. So let's go through the example. The learner, which is your audience, will identify, which is your behavioral verb, and then the condition, well, I, actually the degree of mastery is the structure of three microorganisms. So that's what we want them to, that'll, that's what we'll measure. And then the condition is where, the situation. So um, that is observing specimens uh, under a microscope. So that's the structure. And that's fine for a regular, maybe face-to-face -face classroom. Um, but what we found, especially with immersive learning experiences, is we needed to go further. And you'll note that these standard learning objectives are not learner focused, they're instructionally focused. The learner will. Well, that doesn't empower the learner very much, that's them taking an order. It's also one size fits all, and it doesn't consider the learner experience. So what we did was create Lexos. Next slide, please. In order to create Lexos that are learner focused, based on learner ex expertise and need, and take into consideration the learner's immersive state, we first consider the learner. You can advance it. So we, cre we create the learning objective from the learner's perspective. You'll note that these three tiers of the learning of Alexo are focused on the learner. I will. And then we also include the learner level for differentiation and customization that really appeals to their skill and motivation so they can leverage that depending on where they're starting. You'll notice that we also include the ILXD state. That's that blue content there. Note that we've added this state so we know what immersive state that we want them to achieve or they want they will want to achieve um, by participating in this immersive experience. So we can leverage the four layers of the ILXD model. We can have verbs in there such as intend, immerse, feel, create, but we can also be more specific like embody, persist, empathize, achieve a sense of agency, construct. So all of those because um, should correspond with the behavior, the condition, and the level of achievement that's expected, and it all needs to make sense together. And with that, we have been really effective in driving the design and development of our products to ensure our focus remains on the learner. Next slide, please. It was this focus on the learner that drove us to create my VR scope. We saw a clear need in our client's classroom for a virtual microscope. Students were struggling to get microbiology labs done, limited access to microscopes, 
forced group work, frustrating time limits, and only a small degree of instructor contact and personal guidance. So we created a solution based on student need. We've been able to leverage the Lexos to measure my VR scope's efficacy in changing learner behavior through an immersive learning experience. One of our main intentional goals of this product was to increase access the student has to the instructor without interrupting player experience. We're proud of our solution and students, instructors, and administrators have loved the interactive, measurable experiences. And Boshka will tell you more about how we achieved that. Thank you, Emily. Mm -hmm. uh, just as Emily mentioned, my VR scope is our multi-award winning virtual microscope. With it, students can learn everything from the history of the microscope, learn all of its different parts, what they do, and how to use or adjust them. But the main feature are the lab exercises. We provide a library of these lab exercises for the institutions, instructors, and students to use. But at the same time, we wanted to allow the institutions and instructors to create unique experiences for their students as they do in their classrooms. That led us to create our MyVRScope enterprise solution. Next slide, please. Among other things, our enterprise system allows instructors to manage their classes and create their own lab exercises, where they can specify a method for the lab, add references, create specimens with their own images and or videos, and ultimately set a range of assessments for their students. Now, looking at the ILXD model, our question was, how can we leverage this enterprise system to enhance the immersive learning experience? First, let me tell you something that happened in one of our early playtests that really helped us achieve this goal. We were in the classroom with more than 20 students, all of them testing my VR scope. Every now and then, a student would have a question they would take their headset off and call one of us. As we got near them, they would put the headset back on and continue talking with us. But we were speaking in different worlds. We were in the physical world and they were in the virtual world. At that point, the immersion was completely broken. They were speaking with someone that wasn't there with them on their virtual lab. And as an important stepping stone of our ILXD pyramid, we couldn't let the user lose their immersion. Next slide, please. We went back to the drawing board and started designing and testing new ideas to solve this problem. In the end, we knew the solution was within the enterprise system, but it took us some time to figure out what was the best way to do it. First, we decided that we wanted to let the instructor communicate with the students using our backend. At any time, the instructor could go to our system, check if a student is actively playing a lab exercise and engage in a conversation with them. Then our next decision was between using audio or video. But due to bandwidth usage and possible bad connectivity, we went with audio only. Now, on the instructor side, everything was simple. It was the same as doing a voice call. They could click a button and in seconds, they would be speaking with the students. But on the student side, on the virtual microscope, it was a little more challenging. Our first experience was to deliver the audio coming from the instructor in a sort of voice of God way. But even though the sound was now coming from inside the experience, it still wasn't immersive enough. The user didn't know where that sound was coming from. In order to fix that, we started thinking of ways to justify the audio presence of the instructor in the virtual lab. That's when we decided to use a speaker. It would be in the virtual space, sitting on the desk next to the microscope. And whenever the instructor spoke, there was a highlight on the speaker and together with 3D spatial sound, it was convincing to the user that someone was speaking with them through that virtual object. With this, we solved the problem of communication between instructors and students in our immersive learning experience. 
Not only that, but at the same time, we created a feature that now allows instructors to speak with their students, even if they are using my VR scope from the comfort of their homes. But we didn't stop there. This did fix our immersion problem, but our original goal was to enhance the experience using our enterprise system. How could we use this communication tool not only to maintain immersion, but to deepen it? That's when we moved from a speaker to a 3D human character in the virtual lab. The instructor voice was now coming from this 3D character and using lip sync to match the mouth movements to the sound, together with custom animations to make the character look real, we now virtually place the instructor inside the learning experience. For the students, they suddenly have their instructor right there next to them in their virtual lab. While play testing, we came across another challenge. The instructor was trying to help the students, but they couldn't see what the student was seeing. The solution seemed quite simple. We could just send the screen capture from the student device to our enterprise system. But how would that feel like for the student experience? Before, there was no reason for why the instructor could see the, the students, what the student was seeing, because the student was alone in the virtual lab. But now, since the instructor is present on the virtual lab through that 3D human, it just feels right to the student. Next slide, please. We've been talking about how to maintain or improve immersion, but we can also use the enterprise system to promote other layers of the ILXD, ILXD pyramid, such as the feel layer. Since narrative has a significant part on the overall experience, we wanted to let the instructor have some control over it. When the instructor creates a lab exercise in our enterprise system, one of the things they can add is what we call the lab exercise introduction text. The instructor can write in text format what they want to pass to the students when they start that lab exercise. Then, in my VR scope, the student will hear that introduction text coming from the virtual assistant with text to speech. By carefully writing up that introduction text, the instructor can place the student in a scenario where they feel like they are part of something great, thus improving their overall experience. I also need to share how delighted the players are when they communicate with our virtual assistant. Having someone there with them that they can ask questions really improves the feel layer. The top layer of the ILXD model is the learn layer. In my VR scope, we wanted to give the students the opportunity to contribute to the experience. But at the same time, we have to be careful since the learn layer builds on top of all the other layers and we don't want to break any of them. Most of our lab assessments are limited in how the student can resolve them. The options are already there, which, which makes it difficult for the students to feel like they are contributing with their unique vision. That's why, for example, on the screen capture assessments, we let them annotate on the sample before they create the screen capture. With different draw colors and sizes, they can show the instructor exactly what they want. Every detail is important, and Jim will explain how we brought to life all, the, of, the, all of the aspects of the ILXD pyramid. Thank you, Vasco. This graphic is our empathy engine understanding in our ILXT uh, methodology. So to begin with, why do we care about empathy? And the analogy that I would use is if you think about your favorite movie or book, chances are you can recall the entire uh, narrative, the whole story arc. You can probably recall lots of detail from that story or book, characters, settings, music, you might be able to recall specific lines of dialogue and your favorite scene or your favorite uh, chapter. It may have been decades ago that you first read or first uh, watched that particular piece. And the reason that you remember it still to this day is because you had a deep emotional connection. So something emotionally happened uh, when you were having that experience of reading the book or the movie. So what we're doing with 
our, our ILXD methodology is we're leveraging empathy that we care so that we can increase the uh, learning persistence. So you will learn deeper and you will remember longer and that learning will stay with you um, in a meaningful way. So in this graphic, we have some gears. So this is an engine. And these are all of the contributors that lead toward creating empathy in immersive learning. So you can see that the blue gears are authenticity, embodiment, and agency. So authenticity is in, in a, a nutshell, does this seem right? Does this seem real? Does this seem um, correct? Embodiment is, uh, am I in this? Am I here? Agency is, do I have control over what happens to me and what happens in, in the learning experience that I'm involved in? So in order to drive the empathy, we have our narrative, our story, which we may have even though it's not a story-based simulation, our role in that story. Sense-making, that's what's happening and how does this pertain to me and, and what I'm doing in this learning activity and the skill that I'm developing. And then perhaps most importantly, because it's in the middle of the diagram, meaningful decisions, not lockstep decisions. You can only make these decisions in order, but true meaningful decision-making on behalf of the learner, they get to choose. And then as a result of those selections that they make, those decisions that they make, then things happen. And it's uh, not necessarily the same cookie cutter approach for all learners. So there's three dependent outputs of this machine. One is, I'm here now, so I'm in this experience. I, I believe that I'm here. Two, I care about my role. Like, I care what happens when I'm in here, what's happening to the decisions that I make, the actions that I take, and the things that I see and feel and hear uh, and sense. And then all of that contributes to, I actually feel that this is happening. So I'm here, I care, and I feel that this is real. The reason that this is depicted uh, as an engine with gears is um, to consider what would happen if only one gear was driving. So let's say that the authenticity gear was being driven and all the rest of the gears were just in neutral. So they were just free turning. And if authenticity was the only driver, there would be a slight amount of output on, I'm here now, I care about my role, and I feel this is happening. All the other gears would be turning, not very strong, not very powerful, not very fast, but they would be moving. If two or three or all of the gears are driving, then there's a tremendous amount of power that's being leveraged. So if it's authentic, I have agency, I'm embodied, I am making meaningful decisions, all of these drivers are working, then I really do create, promote this opportunity for empathy with these dependent outputs of I'm here, I care, and I feel. Conversely, all it takes is one gear to be frozen. So if there's some reason that agency uh, is absent and that gear is frozen or embodiment is absent and that gear is frozen, the rest of the engine does not work at all. And there's literally no opportunity to leverage empathy. So we use that model to, to both explain our methodology as well as to remind ourselves um, about the things that we're uh, assessing as we're working with our iterative process of development. So in making my VR scope, the actor, the main player in the VR is the microscope. And one of the things that we set out to do intentionally by design was to make a photorealistic microscope, hence authentic. So that microscope looks like the real microscope. And in this graphic, you can see the model that our game artist made is on the left and the photo of the actual micro microscope that's used in lab classes um, at our client institution is on the right. So you can see they're pretty darn close. So the photorealism of the model was the first step. The second step was the actual articulation of the model. So does this model operate? Will this microscope, this virtual microscope, actually operate like the real microscope? Can I turn the focus knobs? Can I change the elements? Can I move the eyepiece? Do I have to turn the light on and off? Do I actually put a slide on the stage? So then that truly promotes a sense of agency when the learner is literally in control of that microscope as if it were real when they're using it in VR. For example, in our virtual microscope, 
if you put a slide on the on the stage and clamp it down and you look in the eyepiece and it's black the reason that it's black is because you didn't turn the light on so all of the dependent things that you would do with the real microscope you have to do with the vr microscope in the experience and that creates a, a sense of of um of agency and also decision making on behalf of the learners so that was the first step the next step is to situate this star of our experience that we care about in a setting that's authentic so in my vr scope we're in a science lab and we are literally in the science lab so one of the things that we have with immersive learning is we put on the headset we have 100 percent engagement we are in this lab so does this seem real do the props seem real is the lighting seem real is there anything that's jarringly not real so these are the kinds of things that are going to contribute to our sense of, of um, authenticity. The most important thing that we have done at this point now in bringing the microscope into this environment is giving the learner complete control over the microscope. So then that agency, that ability to maneuver, to move the microscope, operate all of the parts in the microscope, the responsibility, hence care, for doing all of those procedures to be able to do something effective with the microscope is all in place just merely by way of our approach and intention in our modeling and our texturing and the creation of our environment. One of the things that we uh, frequently add is some kind of artificial intelligence as part of our immersive learning. And in this case, as Vashko uh, mentioned earlier, we have uh, Dr. Beaker, who is an AI driven um, character that can assist the learner. So one of the things that Dr. Beaker does is Dr. Beaker gives instructions to the learner and those instructions come by way of text that's written by the faculty member. Dr. Beaker can um, give instructions, can answer questions, can provide information and facts about content area, so Dr. Beaker has uh, a diverse set of capabilities that are, and Dr. Beaker can be a male or a female. A couple things that go back to the ILXD model um, in this use of our AI agent, Dr. Beaker, is in order for uh, there to be a effective use of this AI, there has to be a sense of trust. So this is a field um, result. So what Dr. Beaker says, needs to be accurate. Dr. Beaker needs to be able to answer questions reliably. And Dr. Beaker needs to be able to have some kind of a sense of um, emotion themselves. So Dr. Beaker can tell you jokes, Dr. Beaker can tell you facts, and Dr. Beaker will occasionally make comments about your performance, uh, much like you would have in, your, in a discussion with a real faculty member. So to this point then, we have an authentic, believable environment. The learner has a great deal of agency and control over what's happening. There is an AI presence that the, that the learner trusts and they feel as if they're in the experience. So then they're, they're deeply um, embodied. All of these happen by design. So moving from using ILXD to inform our development to actually um, moving the development into deployment, one of the things that we do is play testing. We play test early and we play test often. And play testing is a critical part of our production process. So a play test um, is something that you might not be familiar with. A play test is not a focus group and it's not a pilot. So in a play test, what happens is members of the development team actually go to a location where the learners are and we actually watch them use the product. So the idea is that we're there in the same room with them and we are able to directly observe what they do. In fact, the process is kind of observe, record, ask, debrief, analyze, document, and then iterate. So we use play testing early on and then we repeat that as we go through the development phase. And one of the things that happens when you use play testing, um, and this is a process that has been in, in use for 30 plus years by the entertainment game uh, industry, is that we discover early on what is happening with the user, with the learner using the product. 
So this is in comparison to a previous way of, of developing um, instructional media or support. And that is you have our expertise and we have subject matter experts and we have faculty and we all make our best informed decision and we create a product and then we put it in the classroom. Well, one of the things that we discover in using this play testing as if you were making an entertainment game is that this is truly walking the talk on being learner focused because we continually, I can't think of an instance in over 20 years where we play tested and we didn't discover something we didn't anticipate that made the product a lot stronger. So we use the process of play testing early on and then the play testing also helps us identify things that we'll need later in deployment that we hadn't even started to think about. For instance, Vashko was highlighting the need for the faculty member to be able to communicate to the learner in the experience without making that something that was taking them um, out of the experience. And then again, that was something that we developed uh, an, an understanding of insight toward um, very early on in the process. So something that we know from our experience so far that's critical um, shouldn't have been a surprise to us. So the, where this comment um, is under faculty training, it's 1999 all over again, is that what we're seeing, what we've seen over the last three years is a repeat of when we started bringing game-based learning into the classroom in the late 90s. All of those issues that were uncovered then are being repeated now. So successful deployment and successful experience on behalf of the learners starts with faculty. It's faculty training and more faculty training and more faculty training. Firstly, the entire pedagogy is new. So this is not just another hardware that you hand to a faculty member to use as if it was some kind of a different video. This is a completely different method of, of learning and experiencing the learning. So in order for this to be effective um, in the classroom and in the hands of faculty, they need to have time and training and support. They need to have time to develop immersive learning literacy, which means they need headsets. And they need to experience lots of different kinds of, of VR experiences so that they develop a sense of, of um, literacy and second nature skill so that they can best support their learners in the classroom. We know that we have a dashboard uh, driven web console that provides lots of features for the faculty member to use, which is great if the faculty member has plenty of time to become familiar with those and those are second nature as well. So the thing that Vashko highlighted earlier on in the presentation about the faculty member being able to converse um, with the learner while they're in VR, that's a tremendously powerful opportunity for a, an engagement between the learner and the faculty member, but that's not completely transparent to the faculty member. That's not something necessarily that they've ever done before, especially if you happen to think about this being used in a real time uh, face-to-face -face classroom with 30 learners all doing it at the same time and the faculty members trying to wrangle that. So we have these capacities that are, that are uh, going to be required for the faculty member to get the most out of the experience and the most out of using the dashboards and the capabilities that we have so that all of the learners in the class can have a strong learning experience. So in this uh, sequence, we also have a good deal of effort to have faculty second nature understanding of the application themselves. So they really need to spend a lot of time in this application so that there is not a nook or cranny inside this VR experience that they haven't seen that they don't understand so that they can truly in a, in a seamless way um, interact with learners. By the way, when I say it's 1999 all over again, these were problems when we first started putting game-based learning in the classroom. One of the reasons that game-based learning in the classroom wasn't as effective as it could have been early on is there was a faulted notion that this was just fire and forget. Students love games. All we have to do is make a game, give it to the students, they'll play it and they'll learn. And then what happened over the ensuing 20 years is that it was pretty clearly identified that the faculty member needs to set the stage, anticipatory set. They need to be involved and able to answer questions, especially for um, learners that are struggling. And then most importantly, and I forgot this, the faculty member has to be able to debrief the experience. So this is part of the sense-making process. 
doesn't necessarily happen in VR. Could be in a face-to-face -face discussion in the, in the classroom, in the lab. Could happen in a face-to-face -face, uh, discussion real-time asynchronous in the online course. But that faculty debrief, part of the sense-making process of the learner, is what really drives home and connects all of the things that the learner did, some of which may have been completely transparent to them. They're not really thinking about, oh, yeah, I did learn to do that. At the very beginning, Emily talked about the intention. <clears throat> so one of the things that we do in the intention is that we draw a map of the database. What are the lexos? What are the behaviors? What are the outcome behaviors that we expect to measure? And then the database starts around that. So we, at the very beginning, before we do anything else, we know exactly what it is, the behavior that we want to see, how are we going to measure if it's happening, and then how are we going to capture this in the database? So then the enterprise system itself is a really important part of being able to use immersive learning effectively in the classroom, whether it's face-to-face -face or online. And one of the things that we have um, that you don't have in any other methodology is that this also prevents, presents a tremendous opportunity for insight in a programmatic way. What are all the learners doing? So if we wanted to see a heat map, for example, we wanted to see based on all users, where are they struggling the most um, in this particular experience. We can use our data set that's on the server and we can filter that out and we can understand exactly where these issues are arising and we can target those and that's happening in a way that we can never do if we were um, just working, I shouldn't say just, if we're working with a face-to-face -face, um, lab situation. So back to Emily for a summary. <laughs> so uh, you've seen how uh, both uh, Boshko and Jim have talked through each of the layers. And I just wanted to bring it all together and remind everybody how we intend, how we immerse, how we feel, and how we get the, the learners all the way to that learn level. Um, so in the intention layer, the things that we talked about were truly identifying the learner need collaborating with them, discovering their motivation, who they are. Our learner persona is one of the most important parts of our learning experience design document. We work with learners and faculty and administration to create Lexos, learning experience objectives. Um, and that incorporates, again, that ILXD level, as well as um, more flexibility for who our learners are and a different perspective, something that's focused on the learner. Uh, we really focus, as Jim mentioned, on faculty training. Uh, we do not discount that. It's all about the implementation and uh, it, it actually helps drive need as well from the very beginning. So that's something we identify and pursue and really flesh out from the beginning. Um, we talk through the backend enterprise solutions. Like Jim mentioned, that database model, we have to have that. So we know what the acceptance criteria are. We know what the thing is gonna do in the end. Um, we design around support. We analyze what analytics we're gonna need and we design for that. And then we know which uh, technologies we need to leverage or what research we need to do uh, in order to create the product. So that's the intention layer. And then we get the student in the headset and we, they get to be immersed. And as Vashko mentioned, uh, the thing that we've learned, and Jim mentioned this too from the play test, is that you can't have them take off the headset to talk to their instructor. You have to figure out ways to engage the instructor one-on-one -on -one during the experience. Um, it has to be high quality, fidelity. You need to believe the environment and be in, 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 in that which enables the, immerse, the immersion of that. Um, you want to make sure the speaker is a uh, high quality, that there's a 3D human that looks good. By the way, Jim didn't mention this, but um, our Dr. Beaker model has improved vastly <laughs> since that first iteration. <laughs> uh, so if you found him creepy, that's, don't worry, we know. Um, and then the authenticity really matters a lot uh, as far as the flow state goes, um, that they believe it, that they know that they're able to make changes in their environment, that they can have meaningful decisions, all of that in the immersion layer. Then the feel layer, we wanna make sure that the learner is enabled to complete their work. 
There should not be any friction on that. They should know very clearly what they need to do and that they are empowered to do it, that they are confident and that they have what they need, and then they can make sense of it and use it. So they can finally get to that learn level, which as Vasco mentioned, is the constructivist um, ability to change your environment, share it with others. Um, so in the my VR scope, for example, we have the specimens. They focus the specimen, they take a picture of the specimen, then they annotate the specimen, then they share the specimen. And so that's them learning and constructing their environment based off of their needs and what they want to accomplish. Also in the learn layer, uh, as Jim mentioned, Dr. Beaker, it, you are able to find the support you need through the AI character. You're able to have him tell you a joke if you want, or just to lighten things up, you know? Um, you can use him to stall, or you could use him to help your experience and uh, learn uh, or to demonstrate those competencies. And then finally, there are mechanisms for feedback and iteration with the instructor. And so all of those things we've learned through many iterations and play testing, um, but they do all fall back on that ILXD model. Um, so that's our summary. So Emily, I have a bird walk. Oh no, as always. <laughs> so now that Emily brought up about Dr. Beaker being creepy, <laughs> a couple things that we learned about using AI in products, and these were all play testing results, is the quality of the conversation is more important than the fidelity of the character. Mm -hmm. So if the, if the character is reasonably, not creepy, but reasonably um, recognizable, that's less important than the actual quality of the conversation. So this goes back to three years ago, our very first um, AI that we created was for a reading product. And we took it to the classroom and we're trying it for the very first time with learners. We could not have anticipated this any other way. We turn the learners loose, they start using the thing, and the next thing we know, progress in the game has completely stopped because all of the learners are chatting with the agent. Not about the content, just about to see what they could make the agent say in NLP. So we learned a lot about that, that proposition of, of control and um, the role that the agent plays, as well as accuracy. So our very first version of the agent with um, the AI version one of Google, um, we called her Beth. Beth had a problem with the truth. So you could ask Beth really complicated questions and she would answer them correctly. And then you'd ask her, what's the capital of um, Illinois? And she'd tell you Miami. And the reason why is because we had the filtering level set too low. So then in some cases, the answer wasn't always 100% correct. And of course, that is not something that promotes immersion when you have uh, your AI making obvious uh, errors in fact. <laughs> Sorry, Emily. <laughs> no, it's great. Um, and as Jim mentioned, I mean, we go on bird walks all the time because we love to talk about this. So our next slide actually has our contact information on it. And we do encourage you to reach out. We also have um, our uh, immersive LX website that has a bunch more information on this and examples of other products that we've worked on. But um, I'm noticing that we are running a little short on time. And Jim, Len has an awesome question in chat. Um, so I don't know if you want to read that out. I can't see it. So can oh, you read it? Sure. It's magnificent approach. Well, thank you, Lynn. Um, ungirded by sound strategy. Uh, could you explain how your solution supports the notion of noble failure? <clears throat> so one of the things that um, is uh, an uphill push is it as as I'm guessing you probably are well aware is that faculty and educators in general like to make things that are learning activities that students do properly. So the idea that you're going to build in opportunities to be wrong, either wrong quickly or wrong historically or wrong in lots of different um, types of fashions is not something that we've seen in our experience to be um, an easy sell when you're trying to create game-based learning for educational institutions. And of course, it's the core. 
um, failure is, is the core of experiential learning. You need to be able to fail. You need to be able to experiment. You need to be able to come back and try it several different ways. And you will have one that you connect with differently than others. So that idea of building in that kind of failure um, is something that if it were purely up to us, that would be the one of the core parts of the experience in every product. And then I would have to say that in reality, it ends up being something that we do on a negotiated basis um, with the with the level of tolerance that the particular clients have that we're working with. I was just going to add on that, um, especially in the my VR scope situation, they didn't want a ton of failure opportunities. They wanted more and more support. And our original design was entirely like it would be in a lab, where if your um, specimen is not focused and you turn it in, that's it. You failed. Uh, but they didn't love that. So <laughs> we've, <laughs> we've added some, uh, some mechanics that support the learner a little bit more, guide them in game. Um, so you really do have like a virtual assistant it, throughout your lab, which is a uh, great value added, definitely has added to the learner experience, just not as we originally intended. So it is a back and forth. Did that answer the question? We, if, uh, we could unmute Len, probably. Let me see. He should be able to unmute himself. Okay, Len, you can unmute yourself and talk if you want. Yeah, beautiful answer, I think. Um, well, well stated. Um, still, I, I see that the, I remember that the U.S. Department of Education and Simulation Design suggested that one of the most precious benefits of simulation lies in the notion of noble failure so but you answered well <laughs> so we i think have maybe three minutes to answer another question if anyone wants to unmute and uh, tell us what you thought we're happy to hear you otherwise jim's going to go on another bird walk i'm just going to go <laughs> I just wanted to say, I, can you hear me? Yeah, sure can. Okay. I just wanted to say, um, I, I think it's amazing. I've been kind of following this through Emily um, as this has all been developed. And as a, as a uh, professor myself, um, in looking at training teachers, I'm wondering about the faculty support and the training for this. I'm thinking of myself, you know, um, like with student teaching, for instance, it's always very hard to find the classrooms to place them in. And this could be a really Ooh. great way to have some, you know, um, ex real experiences. But how, what is your training for faculty? How does that work? Emily? <laughs> okay. I'm like, Jim, do you want to? Uh, I suppose okay. we could have this conversation later, but, you know, <laughs> you have three minutes. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's such a great question, and it's not easily answered in two minutes. But I will say that um, that is our, the very beginning of, our intention layer is how are we going to get, uh, Jim calls them neophytes, um, people that are very new to this technology, maybe afraid of this technology, don't want to put on the headset at all, um, really want to work through like the computer back end in order to manage the experience. Mm -hmm. And so we design lots of methods of access. So um, if there's an instructor who um, really can't do VR, really doesn't want to, they can access through the website. Um, we involve the main faculty, especially with our client, they have sort of a national faculty um, and they are part of the implementation conversation from the very beginning. Uh -huh. And then we do lots and lots of um, guides. Uh, we went to Chicago and Jim, what campus was that? Addison? Addison. And we met with all the, fa we've met with all the faculty. We buy them lunch. We make it fun. You know, like we spent a whole day. Luckily we had a whole day with them. Um, and then that really worked to sort of level set for the next day. And our playtest is not just with our students. Our playtest is with our faculty as well. Often they don't know we're playtesting them. <laughs> you know, like we're just kind of like, does this work for you? And how do you feel about it? And, you know, um, and so uh, because of our sort of thoughtful engagement with faculty throughout the learning process, we honestly consider them another level of learner. So what are their needs? What are they motivated by? What will frustrate them and turn them off? Uh, because they, they are boots on the ground. And if we fail at that, 
it'll never get implemented. It'll just be a right. quick they won't thing use on the side. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and you know, something that seems to be specific to um, this tech stack that I've not seen to this level before is that uh, lots of faculty don't want to be the only person in the room that hasn't done VR. Yeah. So it's a real friction problem when you're working with a group of faculty. The best way around it, one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. So try this. I've tried, no, try this. And then one on one, it's you don't get the same kind of pushback that you get with a couple faculty in the back row in the room that they don't want to put the headset on. Yeah, I've tried this. I know all about this. Yeah, because I don't want to look like a noob, you know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, a couple housekeeping notes. So there is a um, link to the survey that we would ask that everyone would please um, do when when we're finished. Also, there's a question about the slide deck being available. And that uh, slide deck is going to be uh, available, I understand, um, as well. Also, our uh, website, which is immersivelx.com, um, not officially uh, sanctioned by our company. It's our uh, kind of our skunk works, if you will. <laughs> that also has um, the same resources at immersivelx.com. And and we would love to hear from you. So please do reach out to any of us um, by email. We'd, we'd love to hear what you're doing, share whatever we can, um, and we'd be happy to provide you any other resources that we have. Also, we have a Zotero um, mm -hmm. research database that we'd be happy to share that. So if you're interested in where some of these ideas that we're stating as fact have to have some efficacy proof, um, we'd be happy to share that. All right. Well, thanks, Emily, Jim, and Vasco. Uh, I think we're about out of time. Uh, the conference committee is working on getting the slide decks available. I think they're going to be distributed through Google Drive. Um, so I just probably keep an eye on your email and the conference schedule for more updates on that. But um, other than that, um, I think we're done here. Everybody, thank you very much for thank joining you so us. Much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye.